uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ina mana, ina reo, e rau rangatira mā, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Stuart Cambridge tōka wingoa, ke rauta au i te oriti tanga, ke te amaranga mātou ranga mātou a hau i mahi ana. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, so good afternoon uh, and welcome to you all. Uh, my name's Stuart Cambridge. I work for Veronica here at the Tertiary Education Commission in our Learner Success Team. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, this is the second in our capability uh, uh, kind of experts sharing their knowledge and experience sessions. Um, so thank you for coming along and thank you to our presenters also. Uh, just a note, uh, we will be recording this session. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, just let me know and maybe after the session perhaps uh, and we can get our video editing people to, to sort that out and make sure you're not identifiable uh, in the final recording. Uh, I'm shortly going to open with a karakia and then I've got a few words of introduction, um, a couple of slides just to give a bit of background uh, overview, a bit of introduction. Then I'll hand uh, back to V uh, to introduce and facilitate the presentations. Um, following that, there'll be um, time for uh, Q&A before we close. Uh, any questions about that so far? Kia ora. All right, then let's open. Um, e te atua homaiki a mātou to maramatanga to rangi marie to kaha me to araha mō tēnei rā. Ake, ake, ake. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to. Um, I was the one who didn't practice sharing the presentation. <laughs> so I'm just going to assume that's working. Kia ora. Uh, before we kick off, um, I just have a few acknowledgements uh, I would like to make. Um, to those who have gone before us on this journey, um, particularly. Inequities in the education system are not something we uh, invented, that's not quite the right word, uh, perhaps discovered uh, in the last five years. Uh, inequities in the system have been around as long as there's been a system. Um, and as long as there's been inequities, there have been many, many uh, people who have gone before us over the decades tirelessly working for uh, the good and the success of all learners. Um, the mantle has now passed to us and uh, we bear this, you know, acknowledging it's a precious and a worthy undertaking. So that's my first acknowledgement. And secondly, um, also to our sector, ref excuse me, sector reference group who we've been working with alongside over the last kind of 12 months or so uh, and working with us closely to develop our uh, learner success community of practice. So um, thank you to you all. Um, so, just a bit of background and apologies to those who have seen this, but it's probably useful to, to re recover it again. As I alluded to before, we want to help um, in this process to grow our sector's capability by providing opportunities and, and platforms to bring us all together uh, to accelerate and drive learner success um, insights and learning. So these sessions like this one we're having today are part of a, a kind of a, a broader effort for us all to take a bit of a deeper dive into these seven learner success capabilities. Um, and we're doing this in, in a bunch of forums and a bunch of um, bunch of formats um, like this webinar, but other workshops, uh, online forums um, and symposiums. Um, oh, shameless plug for the Te Whitea uh, uh, Tauira Success uh, Symposium that our friends at TWOA are hosting, uh, God willing, uh, end of September. So put that in your diaries, 28th, 29th. Um, so a, a bunch of ways really is an opportunity to, for us all to get together and, and, and share ideas, insights, to collaborate, to facilitate a flow of information and exchange of ideas. Um, and the idea obviously is to help us all to improve, uh, you know, our, the way we work uh, and to share best practice, um, our experiences, what works, what doesn't work, um, in, a, in a safe space that we can learn from each other. Um, to also, you know, broaden um, the understanding and the awareness of, of what we're up to. You know, at the TEC, we've been able to engage with a, a relatively small number of tertiary education organisations, but we need this to be adapted and adopted across the whole of the system if we're going to make a difference for all our learners. Um, and to provide a way and a, and a mechanism by which we can 
talk about and explore new opportunities, new possibilities, um, and different ways of working that, that can solve these problems. So we're focusing on these seven learner success capabilities. These are the things uh, that we've seen, uh, that we've evidenced both locally, but also from other jurisdictions. These are the things that we think, that we believe uh, the system needs to get right across the whole of the organization, across the whole of the system. We need to be good at all of these things uh, in order to effect learner success and to do that properly. So a couple of months ago, uh, we had a session on data and technology, uh, which kicked this off. Um, if any of you missed that, uh, weren't able to attend or interested, I'm pretty sure we can probably get a recording. Um, he says without talking to the boss first, thank you very much. <laughs> but in this session, we're talking, uh, focusing on, on the idea of partnerships, which are one of, you know, they're all important, but some are, some are more equal than others. Uh, and this is really one of the things that's really important. Um, because, you know, uh, learners don't come to tertiary education in a vacuum, if you'll excuse the term. You know, they have lives and experiences before they come to you, and they will do so long after they leave you. Our job in the time that they're in tertiary education is to make that experience as useful in the broadest sense of the term possible, as useful as possible for them and for their family and whānau in broader society. So, you know, if we are serious about putting learners at the centre, then we need to make learners partners in their own education journey, surely. How is their voice represented and truly heard in your organisations? If we're serious about understanding where the learners come from and what they need and want from tertiary education, then we need to understand their prior experience, their, their context, if you will. What makes them tick? What motivates them? And what gets in the way of educational success? So how do we get that? How do we understand those lessons and those insights if we're not talking more broadly to a learner's family and whānau, or their previous school, for example? If we're serious about supporting learners in tertiary education who need a whole range of supports at various times of their lives, well, how do we actually help them connect with the people and the organisations both within and without our organisations that can provide that help? And if we're serious about helping learners achieve their aspirations beyond tertiary education, then how do we do that if we have no idea what the labour market needs are and the sort of people and the skills employers want to hire? Sits enough from me by way of introduction. You don't want to hear from me anymore. Thanks once again for your time. I'm excited to be here and to, to listen to these presentations and just get to, you know, hang out with clever, dedicated, and passionate people like you are um, on our Learn Success journey. So, Mati Huru Huru Kaariri Te Manu, Namihi Nui, Tina Kotu Katoa. Over to you, V. Namahi um, nui, Stu. Thank you so much. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, ko ko Veronica Pritchard Aho. He kai mahi aho ki te amoranga matua ranga matua. So I work here at the TEC within the Orita Tanga team. In the spirit of uh, Rotuman Language Week, no ear to you all. Welcome. I also just have to say, and Pete Jones will uh, know this, that uh, all us Aucklanders have just been given a civil defence notification about um, flooding. So if you all see us running off the screen um, and logging off and you're not from Auckland, um, then just wish us well, um, but please do carry on the mahi because this is really still very important. Um, so on that exciting note, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next segment of our session. Um, so thank you, Stu, for setting the tone in our scenery. Um, I'll be introducing our amazing speakers who um, are here to speak to us today. Uh, when we first envisaged the session, we thought about um, what are some of the partnership models and contexts within our tertiary sector that we might just need to hear a little bit more about and unpack and come together and have a conversation about. Um, and so that, hence why we've got um, who we have here with us today. Um, for the Q&A, if you don't mind, if you've got a question that kind of springs to your mind as our presenters are going, just pop it into the chat. Um, also, once all presentations are finished, we will open up the floor for some discussion and Q&A, so you can also ask directly from the floor as well.
So to kick us off and anchoring us in what partnership means um, with regards to our respected to our Māori, um, we have Professor Vaughan Bidwa, um, who is uh, from uh, Te Awanui Arangi, uh, Te Wharuanango o Awanui Arangi. He's the Executive Director of Academic there. And aside from his extensive um, background in education, um, I'm told he's a very good fisherman, um, especially with his children. And apparently he can beat any of us in sports, um, even without trying. So on that wonderful note, um, I welcome you, uh, Professor Vaughan, to kick us off with our presentations. Uh, tēnā koe, Vaughan, ka nā mihi ki a koutou uh, i te whānau i te kaupapu tēnei wā. Um, he uri a hau, uh, nā tirangi nei uh, ngai tai uh, whakatoea me tūhoi hoki. Um, yes, um, my name is Vaughan and it's a real privilege to be here today to share uh, with you all and, and also to listen um, about the amazing things that you're doing out in your respective communities. Um, and talk about this this notion of of partnership. And um, I just want to firstly acknowledge uh, Veronica and Stuart uh, for bringing us together. Ketemi uh, kiaukui, Stuart. I to karaki i te nei ata i i i to tata hui na mi kiaukui. And um, this presentation, I'll, I'll be um, quite as brief as I can be in terms of telling our story as to Whare Wānanga o Awanui Aarangi. And I think uh, when we talk about partnership, um, effectively what we're talking about is relationships and what relationships mean in an educational context. And our educational context is um, a dual one in the sense that we are Wānanga, um, um, as legislated through the uh, Education and Training Act, um, and we were born out of a um, the struggle, I guess, for our people and communities um, to try and achieve the aspirations that we want to achieve and flourish as communities um, that we'd like to flourish as. And so, the the, the presentation I'm going to give to you today is really about our story and the scoping partnership. And so um, when we talk about partnership, we can go from the learner through to the crown in our context. Um, we talk about learners being partners in teaching and learning, and then there's also a partnership conversation that's that's had with communities and then also with the crown, of course, with us being a legislated wānanga. So it's going to give you some insight and apologise for having to move quite quickly through the slides, but. Um, I know there's some other amazing presenters there as well that we'd like to hear from, but I hope um, there's some things that resonate with you in the work that you're doing. Um, yeah. But we've um, you, you'll hear about our story and our frank and open conversations, for example, with TEC and NCQA, uh, with the centre in terms of um, supporting what we do. Um, and then also, um, what teaching and learning looks like for us and means for us in terms of the relationships that we have uh, with our tawira. Um, so uh, I've titled this The Power of Partnership and um, the use of the term power is um, deliberate and, and it speaks about uh, how partnerships can be empowering and both and they can also be disempowering if, if they're not effective partnerships. Um, and it's about success for our learners, but um, it's also about success for our learners, their whānau, their hapu iwi, their communities um, that they engage with and that they work within. So um, I think it's really important to have a bit of an understanding of who we are, and I'll try and give that in, in uh, this short slide. Um, we were established, uh, one of our founders was Sir Hirini Moko Mead, um, who is an amazing individual. He's 96. And he's a writer in residence. He is still at Te Wānanga Awanui Arangi. Um, he's just finished a, a, a book on Mātauranga Māori, which um, I understand which will be out shortly. Uh, but he was the visionary, really, under the auspices of the Tribal Authority back in 1989 uh, to um, develop uh, Te Wānanga Awanui Arangi. 
And the distinctive difference that we have between ourselves and the other two Wananga, Te Wananga Aotearoa and Te Wananga Raukawa, is firstly in our name. So we deliberately use Te Whare Wananga, and that reflects our provision. Um, so we're the only institution in the country that delivers from adult community education right through PhD and uh, professional doctorate. Um, we have international students from Washington State, from Hawaii. Um, we've just recently enrolled a student from Chile. Um, and we're really proud of uh, what we've built as an Indigenous institution um, in terms of research, um, uh, Indigenous research um, that is about um, uh, contributing to the broad body of knowledge that universities and other institutions contribute to our understandings of the world. Um, so we, I think the key thing to understand about our history and our whakapapa is uh, we were established in response to the to the failing failings of education generally um, for our people, and that's openly recognised and acknowledged. And, and I just want to uh, again um, acknowledge uh, Stuart in his intro um, that the centre is is very aware of that and are trying to do things differently. And essentially, this is what um, our presentation today is will be um, trying to sow the seed about in terms of. What you're currently doing there'd be many of you that are doing amazing jobs and being quite disruptive in the spaces because you you know you know what's best for your learners and um, we really advocate for that because um, sometimes you have to be a little bit disruptive to get any sort of real change um, but we are in a, a, an institution of higher learning um, uh, we get, engage in research and you know we see ourselves as an indigenous conscience of, of society as well the next slide is really about giving you know, a picture of our, our learners, our tawira. Um, so generally, um, the majority of our learners, and this has shifted over time, um, came to our institution, had, had no formal qualifications. So some left school with no um, qualifications and had to start uh, uh, from the beginning. Um, this horrible term that we used to describe um, our demographic of students, which isn't used anymore as a deprivation measure. Um, and it, it's just a term to sort of recognise that um, you know, these were communities of uh, deprivation and poverty and, and, and struggles. Um, and uh, we had uh, one of the lowest schools in terms of uh, a, a description of the students um, that came to our institution and still do come to our institution. Um, it's obviously not a term that we use, but um, it, it's it's a good point that's made. Um, so with that comes new challenges in, in terms of supporting these particular students in our communities. And it's important that we're talking about learner success. Like Stuart said, you've got to understand uh, your students, how they tick, where they've come from, and uh, you know, what's happening in their lives. If you really, you know, really want to make a difference and and keep them engaged and and be transforming in their own life experiences because um, we have many stories of students that have hung in there, done really well, finished their first certificate, moved into undergrad um, qualification, and then now doing PhD and master's studies. So we see that as, as, as education being transformational, just like everybody else. Um, but in terms of today's session, the, this idea of partnership is, is a little bit of a contentious too for us um, because um, when uh, we've been approached to develop partnerships, albeit with the Crown or institutions or agencies, um, we've found that um, um, they haven't really met the needs or heard uh, the needs in terms of what we would expect of what we believe a partnership looks like. But effectively for us, when we talk about partnership, it's about the types of relationships that we have, that we want to nurture um, with um, the communities that we work with, with the Crown, with our staff, with our learners. And these relationships for Abunui Arangi are all underpinned and premised by the notions of whakapapa and through the learnings of Te Ao Māori. And so um, that's the grounding of in terms of the basis of where our relationships are founded upon, um, connections are hugely important. Um, understanding 
the people that you're wanting to work with well, um, getting your name correct. We've had a lot of relationships with institutions that have mispronounced us or referred to us as Aotearoa or um, as Awananga, not Fariwananga. Those subtle and small things are all about um, how well you you know the people that you want to make relationships with and have relationships with. Um, and it's usually important for us that those little things uh, are signs and signals in terms of um, the genuine intent when um, uh, outside groups or other institutions want to have relationships with us. So um, we, we, we cultivate and nurture uh, productive relationships, but um, it's important from our perspective that these types of relationships uh, are defined by this. There's always a power tension, whether it be a relationship between a teacher and a student, um, there's a, a power relationship that exists there, um, whether it's between an institution um, that's in the tertiary sector, there's a power tension that exists here because we live in a market that's quite comp competitive. Um, so it's about recognising that up front and understanding that it's important that um, we try and balance those, those differences sometimes. For example, the accountability frameworks that we use to um, develop relationships with TEC and NZQA um, are quite transactional. You know, we're, um, we're, it's like a buyer-supplier type relationship sometimes. And that, that's important because um, this, the government provides funding for our organisations to do what we do and there needs to be accountabilities. But we all, always talk about other ways that we can measure our accountabilities back to organisations and to others. We also have accountabilities to our communities. So uh, our, our iwi and hapu, our founding iwi, uh, the iwi and hapu that we work with across the country, um, we have accountabilities there as well. Um, and there's also the power tensions between your staff and uh, as employers. So there's all these transactional types of relationships that need to be um, navigated um, and, and nurtured in order to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Um, so we think that's an important understanding when, when you start talking about partnerships. And from a Te Ao Māori, Mātauranga Māori perspective, um, we find it a lot easier to use our own values and kupu to, to describe and define these types of relationships. So whakapapa, of course, is, is the interconnecting thread that we use, which is connections. And then, of course, um, the values that many of us know and use as well, in terms of manakitanga, whanangatanga, uh, tūranga waiwai. I heard Erica uh, mention earlier her, her tūranga waiwai. And those are wonderful ways of connect, connecting. And, um, and while we have transactional relationships with ins across institutions, if we can embed these types of um, ways of relating to each other, I think we can achieve amazing things. And uh, that's really important for us. Um, coming up just to, to the last two slides. And so this emphasis around partnership and power. So when we talk about from the learner to the crown and to our communities, as it's really about the power sharing and the power potential that we have uh, uh, amongst ourselves and within ourselves and in those relationships um, and how important it is to understand those contexts. Um, so we're all impacted by the cultural context that we bring to um, relationships that we have with organisations. Um, we also have stru structural contexts that we need to be aware of, the, the legislation, the laws, the rules, the regulations, the policies that we abide by. And then there's the political factors um, that are present. So the politics of education, the politics of knowledge, um, that's just a recognition that um, it's not always an even playing field in these different settings that we have conversations with each other and that it's important that we understand that. And there's some processes that we think are important um, in terms of trying to nurture and cultivate those types, types of partnerships. One is dialogue, which effectively means, you know, um, communication is not one way. Um, it, it's, it's a process of meaningful 
conversations and listening and hearing and speaking. Reciprocity is that we we respect each other and we will we will work together to achieve the same goals. Um, we will understand each other's context um, and we will um, you know support each other in, in the aspirations that we have. And one of the most important things in the work that we've done in terms of partnership, and this is whether it's in the classroom, as a teacher, is about being reflexive. Um, and reflexivity really is about um, having a critical understanding of the way that we see things and uh, an empathy toward understanding the way that other people see things. Um, if you put ref reflexivity next to reflection, if I looked at a situation and made a judgment call and I reflected on it, to be reflexive would be to turn around and ask myself, now, why did I make that judgment? Why did I see it in that way? And we think reflexivity is an important uh, part of any type of relationship that you have, whether that be in the classroom with your learners, with the families that you work with, with the communities or institutions that you're working with, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, in closing, I guess what this sort of sums up for us is that in our view, education is not a neutral act. It's a cultural one. At times we need to disrupt in productive ways the way we think, act and do to achieve meaningful change. And I just want to congratulate many of you here today because I know you already do that. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do. Um, and um, as the Wananga and with the tertiary sector and TEC and the work that they're trying to do, um, I think you know it'll be our children and their children's generations that we will really see the difference of the work that you are all doing. Um, so there's just a couple of quotes there that um, have been quite impactful on myself of late. Um, one is by Nicholas Jani, uh, who was a, um, uh, a leader at Harvard, who lectures at Harvard University. And the other is Paulo Freire, who's, who's the one that's really influenced my work and my teaching and learning. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I know there's other presenters who are going to do um, give an amazing quote at all, but I hope there's something there that you can take away. And Veronica, I'll hand it back to you. Nami. Nami Nui, uh, Professor Vaughan, thank you so much uh, for your kōrero and for sharing your heart. Um, I think it was always going to be important that we anchor the discussion around partnership with the lens of te ao Māori, um, maturanga Māori, tikanga Māori. And so thank you for delivering on that um, for us all, uh, Professor. Um, we now move to... Uh, Tawira learners, uh, which is what we all want to hear from. Um, so we now go over to uh, Lincoln University, who won't be flooding and raining like Auckland is. Um, and I'm going to now hand it over to Janelle Blythe, uh, who's the Student Experience Manager at Lincoln, who will then uh, go on to introduce her team uh, in their presentation. Um, just another note, if you do have some questions, um, particularly around Professor Vaughan's uh, preso, please feel free to pop that into the chat. Otherwise, you can hold it and we can ask directly from the floor during our Q&A time. Over to you, Janelle and Tawira, the stars of our show's learners. Thank you. While Cam's sharing our presentation, um, I'll introduce my role um, at Lincoln University for Janelle Taho. I am incredibly blessed, um, I think, with one of the best roles in the world, and that's to, to work with Tawira, like we have in the room today. Um, student experience at Lincoln is incredibly important. Um, I'm going to flip to the next slide. Yeah. Just to put it, things into the context for you of our values, um, we adopted some values probably four to five years ago now, um, one of which is students at our core, which is so important to our topic today. My role at Lincoln is to help um, advocate of champion for Taweta uh, with our community, our internal community. What does that really mean, students at our core? Um, we are shifting from that meaning we get student feedback, say, via surveys, um, to more meaningful partnerships. And we are using the Fidia Nalo framework, which I think is absolutely amazing. Um, 
to be able to actually give us a bit more formality around what we're doing. It's a learning journey for us in that respect. We, I think this year, are in a really good place with the toilet we have in the room to strengthen what we do in this space. What I wanted today is for this not to be about me and my experience. It's for you to hear from our Tauria. So we have a lot of student leaders in the room here who do an amazing um, kaupapa in this space. Uh, they really know their stuff. So um, yeah, I look forward to you asking questions of some of them later on as well. Uh, this is about them and them sharing what they do at Lincoln University. So I hope you enjoy what they, they have to share. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Trevor Sobo. I'm the Tumuaki Taki Roa, the current president for Te Alparaki, um, the Maori Students Association here at Lincoln. Kia ora My name is Brooklyn Gregkins. I'm the other uh, current president for um, Te Alparaki, and I'm a third year BCom ex student. I'm Amy. I'm the Lincoln University Students Association president, and it's my fifth year. Good I'm Ken Holmes. I'm the Lincoln University Students Association Disability EDI and Wellbeing Group, and I'm in my third year doing a Bachelor of Commerce with Agriculture. So, our Student Experience Board, Holly Fauka Kawera, we co chair that between the Lusa president the Tauwharaki Tumuaki and our Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Student Life. And this means that we have a voice on this committee. And then this board, along with our um, Te Rokumufuaku Tauera, the Student Experience Working Group, both of these have more students on them than staff, which means that our groups which focus on students and students' experience are genuinely um, about students because we have so many students. We also have positions for different groups so that we have representation of lots of different student groups on campus. With our orientations that we do at the start of semester, we have some students which design the present presentations for those and then we all MC those presentations so that when we have new students coming, they are hearing from current students what they need to know and then the photo there is an example of some of the activities that we do as part of our orientation to help students find out all the services on campus and what they need to know. Uh, in collaboration with LU, we also run lots of different campaigns. Um, for example, in my role as a student experience facilitator, I'm helping with a anti-discrimination campaign for the Lincoln University gym. Um, that's involved me and a group of Toyota together presenting an idea to Alex, who is our Safer Communities Program Advisor at our unit, um, and together we're creating a plan and also working out key context to contact to understand that process. And that's an ongoing process, but we're hopeful that it's going to be done at the start of semester two. We have a lot of different boards and committees at the university, and we have student representation on pretty much all of this. So we did a wee count up and we've got representation on over 40 of these various groups. So these are right from University Council, which we sit on, academic board and all sorts of different working groups. So this means that students are having a say in policies and what happens on campus at all levels. And I guess going on, moving on with that from Amy's point with all the committees and boards, uh, this year's the first year, so we have pay parity between Te Alparaki and Lusa for both the president and all the executive members, which is a huge step um, for us to be able to engage with our Te Alparaki executive, um, for them very much an operational role and I guess a huge commitment um, from Lincoln University to support us going forward in developing our own um, Māori leadership um, within our executive. And I guess to touch back on what Amy was saying, like um, with the over 40, 40 plus boards and committees, um, it's important to note, I think, that as students, we're sitting on all levels of this. So um, while we have good representation in the, I guess, middle and lower levels of different committees and subcommittees, um, Amy and I also sit on the council, which is, I guess, that's where the top of 
the top of the uni is. And I know for us, we are uh, talking with other Māori student associations around New Zealand. We are the only um, ones to be invited on council so far. And it's, um, I guess, a good uh, aspiration for different Māori students associations um, around New Zealand. So, yeah, no, it's important for us to have a voice at the top there, and we're very grateful for that. And then in line with uh, that voice, we try to sum up a way of how to say constructive relationships without saying professionally disagree. But I guess we very lucky that we have uh, time with the vice chancellor, the deputy vice chancellor, one on one time, and we do have constructive conversations. Um, I guess in class focusing on the end goal of a better student experience for all Toyota, that we do uh, quite often disagree on points, um, but then also keep in mind that we always respect the person. Um, and we just unpack different ideas. So that's been a real key one for us over the last two years, is focusing on building better ideas and better concepts for our Toweta and then um, just maintain that professional relationship. And then with that following into, I guess, a key one, one of our key focuses, what's the Aotearoa is our wellbeing of our Toweta. Um, and it was touched on in the previous presentation. When Toweta leave, their whānau, if anyone would come to a new place, that first year, we really focused on an integrative approach with our student experience team and student health. And that looks like uh, Brooklyn INA. We all had meetings at the start of the year with Janelle, um, with some of our counsellors and health staff, focusing on, I guess, some of the challenges our Toyota would face so we could all come together as a team to approach some of those. And for us this year, that's made a huge difference to be able to be proactive and get in front of some of those challenges. Uh, so, Lincoln has relatively finished their disability action plan. Um, there was some work done from Paula Morrison, who is the academic or quality person. I'm not sure on the exact role. Um, but as part of that process, throughout my time at uni, me and lots of other Tawira in the inclusive education uh, cohort, so for disabled learners and people who need learning support, we've had a disability reference group. Uh, with that, we've come together quite frequently to discuss key aspects of what we want included in that disability action plan. And the way we've kind of done it is actually creating student voice first and then policy later. And I think that's really made Toyota Voice really paramount in how we've done it. And it really shows the inclusivity and working relationship between LU and Toyota. And it's awesome to see, and I know I'm going to blow our trumpet a little bit here, but I've heard through the grapevine that our DAP was used as an example for other universities, which is really quite cool. Uh, we also run Respectfully Lincoln, which is a student-led facilitation session around sexual harm and which is healthy relationships, whether that's with each other, alcohol and drugs, and just generally moving from a, I guess, secondary education to tertiary education and how it's different. Um, as part of that, Tawina run those sessions. We're employed by the university as student experience facilitators to run those. And as a group, we have completely changed how it used to be ran and we've really implemented different changes that us who've experienced those sessions previously have wanted to change. And it's been really good to see the collaboration between everyone to actually respect that student voice. Thanks, Cam. Um, and I guess to bring it full circle back to the partnerships that we were talking about and Travis touched on a little bit, we're very lucky that um, not only do, you know, uh, we sit on council and all these different boards, but we also get to have one-on-one -on -one meetings and we build good relationships with them. The senior leaders at, at our university and we have regular meetings with our vice chancellor and deputy vice chancellor um, as well as the director of student administration and student health um, hamish and those meetings are a key for us to i guess keep in the in the loop with what's going on on the ground um, so that we can offer support to our students um, so they're not just having support from staff, but students as well. Um, so those meetings are very key for us, and we've built those relationships over the year. Um, yeah. So, so uh, 
I'll talk a little bit about our role, Tiafira Lucky's role in supporting um, Māori Tawera and, and Pacifica Tawera. So uh, we we liaise with Te Manutake, but which we'll, Travis will talk about soon. But um, we offer support with studies and um, especially in our first uh, with our first year students, it, it tends to be quite a big jump coming from high school to university and kind of figure out new ways to study. Um, so we've got a lot of, I guess, older people that have done um, those classes before and Te Manutaki liaises uh, gets us in contact with those students that are in need of support um, and we offer them, them support through there. Uh, also, we've got welfare funding available, both Te Awhiraki and Rusa have welfare funding available and um, this year we've had uh, good engagement through that. Um, and we've had a lot of students, especially after after the floods up north, um, coming to us for asking for support. Um, so yeah, we've been able to provide them support and uh, financial and um, studies as well. Thanks, Brooklyn. Um, just to build on Brooklyn's point, so Manutaki is our Maui and Pacifica um, support team here at Lincoln University, and they're probably one of our key relationships. Um, in terms of um, they support us and they're very much in a mentor. We look at them as a mentor. We go to them for advice um, and there's a huge amount of trust that's been built up over the last two years um, in building that relationship. And it's we have weekly, even sometimes two to three times a week, catch ups with them and discussions. And like what Brooklyn was saying, there's a real key relationship that they have. Uh, they support students academically and they will know if a student is falling behind and then they can come to us um, with the privacy of the student at the centre of it, but ask for us to support and then we can um, use our resources to support um, Tauria, which is really, really key for us. Um, and then we can bring them into our whare and to our events um, and really create that final connection for them that they might be missing um, being down here. And then I guess that sort of leads into, we so, uh, create a strategic plan for the last two years with Te Aoharaki. Um, and especially this year, it's been amazing that we've had university stakeholders on every level sort of come in and read that document and ask how they can support us. Um, and that's been really key for us to be able to deliver events, uh, get our funding, and then uh, for us, a real key learning curve on the budgeting and how to, to deliver successful milestones uh, going forward. And I guess a key um, engagement factor out of that strategic plan that we highlighted early was getting engagement with the first years uh, during our orientation week. Um, so this year was really successful for us um, as students associations. Um, we ran different events throughout, throughout the week, um, such as free food, loose around toga and afterglow, which was two our week events in themselves. Uh, we had an orientation day followed by goose chase, which we put on uh, 250-odd sausages, which you can see in that photo, a couple of snags left there. Um, and we had people coming through our whare, um, and we started to build those connections early with the first years. And, and I think that was important because it gave them a familiar face that was, you know, there or well, around their age. Um, and I think that it's made them feel more comfortable as years gone through um, to come and talk to us. So. And then probably building on our O week, we're very lucky for our large events and we'll probably use um, to wiki or to Māori. Last year, for us, it was our first, I guess, time working with the university, be able to plan an event. And the university um, actually took a step back and said to us, we could run a Māori language week for the whole university in terms of coming up with a plan and they would resource us so we could have access to uh, the social media platforms. We had communication plans. We had so much support and for us, it was, that was a real key part for us, for us to be able to celebrate our culture, bring everyone in and share that. And there was a huge amount of trust built there um, with Te Awharaki and the Māori students um, and with the rest of the university, the amount of respect um, and the dialogue that happened, all the learning for us and I'd say for the university was huge and there was just nothing but respect there. So, um, and that's just one example of a big event that we've had support with and that's ongoing um, with all our events is that the university supports us, especially Janelle's team um, with, everything that we need and if it's not there um, there's always some really good problem solving that happens around the table with everyone in this room and then even more um, which is really empowering um, for outside. 
Uh, so this has been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Veronica and Stuart, for allowing us to share um, Tawera experiences here at Lincoln University. Wonderful. Uh, let's give them a round of a virtual applause um, for our Taweda. Um, I mean, I, I really just want to honour the courage that you have uh, had to speak to us today, guys. I can imagine some of these sessions can be daunting, um, but remember you are our subject matter experts. Um, so thank you for being awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you also to you, Janelle, for offering uh, your wonderful learners to be here today. So um, wonderful. Um, so we've uh, heard uh, in the context of Te Ao Māori what partnership means. We've now heard uh, from our learners themselves uh, what partnership uh, with their university looks like. We now move to a slightly different context and come to our Workforce Development Council. Um, and so we have here Erica Cumming, who's our General Manager Engagement and Partnerships at Waihanga Arado. Um, she's been on the road journey for a very long time with us here at TEC and worked at all of the different WDCs throughout their establishment. I mean, if you can't tell by her hair, which is actually making me less depressed in the flooding weather right now, um, she's also so a hairdresser and continues to be one. So on that note, Erica, um, over to you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko hokanui te maunga, ko taura te awa, ko Ngāti Pāke Atika Iwi, ko Korabao te tuanga waiwai, no marua wai e hau, inga rei, ki a te whanganui ata, no e uh, roha ana, ko Erika Kameng toko ingoa, uh, ki e wahanga ararau, uh, e mahi ana, e pauruburu ku rangai pa reka reka toku tūnga. So yes, Erika Kameng, um, thank you very much, uh, Veronica. You'll see me sitting um, in my image. I think I still have that uh, behind me. So this is my tūanga waiwai. This is our family farm down in Goa. Um, lots of people down in Goa wouldn't even know that Maruruai is actually the te reo. Um, name for that, so I'm helping educate a few people along the way. Um, and uh, and Veronica has let the cat out of the bag. Yes, I um, am still hairdressing. Uh, having started an apprenticeship back in 1979, um, which I don't normally put the figure on there, which is a really long time ago. So I feel like I've traversed vocational education for a very long time. Starting as an apprentice, um, I moved into being a, a business owner and then became employed at the hairdressing industry training organisation uh, under uh, as a national moderator and then became the chief executive for a, uh, a big chunk of time, um, retired from there and then have bounced around vocational education, contracted to BCITO as their advocate for women. So really focused on setting up the, the space to look at how to get more women into construction and infrastructure. Um, and yes, more recently was privileged, I guess, enough to be part of the establishment unit setting up the Workforce Development Councils and then came across and forgot to leave. Um, so so here I am as a General Manager for Waihang Araro Construction and Infrastructure. So just bear with me as I do the non-technical find the PowerPoint slide for a sec. Oh, hang on. I'll just, I just want to unshare that for me. Just make sure I've got that. We all good there? Yeah. Um, so look, I, I looked at the presentation when I was thinking about this and um, partnering for success, I was listening to Professor Vaughan and, and I was thinking there that actually partnering instead of for success, maybe if we just changed it, it could be partnering equals learner success um, might be um, a really interesting way for us to think about um, what we do. So um, I put this image in here because I was thinking about the speakers and the people that were on the panel and um, had that, that, not that this is to be disparaging to any of our other speakers um, and hoping that I don't look like a panda, um, but you know, really thinking about one of the things for the Workforce Development Councils is that we don't actually have connection with Akonga. And, um, and it's quite a challenge for us. You know, I'm not meant to be getting into challenges immediately, but it is a real challenge for the Workforce Development Council is actually um, how we hear the voice and how we make sure that our mahi is actually doing the best um, for learners now and in the future. Um, so I know that some of our Workforce Development colleagues are already online, so I might be telling them how to suck eggs, but that's all good. Um, the Workforce Development Council, so Waihanga Araro and its um, five 
other workforce development councils were set up about 18 months ago as part of the reforms to vocational education. Uh, we, we, were, we were born out of, um, I suppose, the need to, to make change. Um, some, of, some of those in the education have felt that because qualifications were developed inside the industry, training organisations, there was perhaps a, um, a mix of drinks and that um, looking after the apprentices as well as providing that role wasn't necessarily um, the best thing. Um, so, so change occurred, as some of you um, will well know. I've got a slide in a minute about that. Um, but I guess our significant thing is actually how do we make a difference that actually will make change in vocational education and that learners and employers, communities and our country actually you know, can thrive in the future. So it's about opportunity for, for all. One of our colleagues uh, talks about how to make the sausage, or how, which is a bit of a random thing, how the sausage is made. And so this little slide was put together about what we actually do. Um, we work with uh, industry iwi, hapu, not in there specifically, but totally, um, and workforce influences, how to actually hear the, the needs of and what are the workforce needs. So we look at all equity considerations that we can. Um, it's informed by our engagement with, with Māori, uh, Pacific people, people with disabilities and other priority groups. We try and translate that into a range of different things like you know, strategy, our qualifications, so um, qualifications, skill standards, micro-credentials. Um, we provide advice to the Tertiary Education Commission about how to invest in vocational education. Um, we, Because we look after the qualifications, we undertake the quality assurance processes, so ensuring that, um, that providers are doing the best they can and that uh, education is fit for purpose. Um, endorsing the uh, programs is new, uh, as some of you may know, so quite a significant thing about how we'll look to make sure that the programs are going to be gain fit for purpose. And then relationships. So I'm thinking back to Professor um, Vaughan's comment about relationships and, you know, really we can't have a partnership without first spending that time and having relationships. And I guess all of that is um, that that will enable learners um, to have to access relevant programs, you know, for um, from quality education providers. Um, I've got other slides. Oops, I'll just sit back to that one. A little bit more detail without going into too much more, but already said, um, you know, we look after the qualifications. So that's um, come out of the industry training organisation and sits within the Workforce Development Councils. We undertake the quality assurance and that's kind of moving away from being that kind of, uh, I suppose, inspector hit over the head, quality assurance, moderation stuff, and trying to sit beside our training providers so that we can uh, walk together and think about how to create those best environments for our learners. Um, the endorsing function, as I talked about, uh, the advice to TEC is really significant. And this is about ensuring that the that vocational education um, that TEC will be investing in, the areas that the industry actually needs, um, and in the places that it needs, both in terms of from a uh, a regional perspective. So if we think about the flooding, not up in Tamaki today, but in um, the, the flooding that we've you know, experienced and people have seen the cyclones in the Hawke's Bay, you know, if we need to be talking to TEC about shifting uh, uh, investment for a period of time, that sits within our, within our bucket. If there's new areas and new industries that emerge, you know, maybe needing to invest in talking about that as well. And part of that comes significantly from the skills leadership role that we play. So identifying the current and future skill needs, where the industries are going in the future, and hoping that education will be kept, keeping up with that so that we've got people um, ready for work in the places where we need it at the right time. Um, and brokerage is kind of a little bit unknown, but how we're going to sit beside and really partner with as many organisations as we can, both in industry and government, to again do the best we can for industry. So um, this is a bit of a random slide. I'm not too sure how much I'm going to talk to that, but really just, to, um, I suppose, to reinforce that the Workforce Development Councils have a national role. So it's really imperative that we hear the voice of industry from a national perspective. That's really challenging in itself as to where you find the people that you need to need to find. Um, we can work really closely. So that kind of partnership approach is thinking about how we work with the regional skills leadership groups. They're in region, they're working with iwi, they're naturally iwi are, you know, in region for region. And so working with those um, regional skills leadership groups is really important that we can actually help reinforce voice or um, extend that as well. 
and naturally then you know how we'll look to work with our training providers uh, across so the likes of the extension of you know, tipuganga um, the PTEs and the wānanga as well. Uh, who do we represent? This is for Waihanga Arado, uh, um, broken in actually 58 industries, uh, a little bit. There's no way you wanted to see that on a slide. Um, so broken into 11 kind of groupings. Uh, and so from a team perspective, we have relationship managers who are looking to work with our sector portfolio groups, people, and see how we can be, you know, working alongside them uh, again to hear that to hear that voice of, of what's happening in industry. Um, uh, just a little slide about giving you some context for those that aren't necessarily connected into the construction infrastructure sector. Um, that's the scope of, of what we're dealing with um, just currently. Um, we know that there is, you know, various times of construction infrastructure and massive, you know, growth mode and then, you know, backing off and then we have, as you say, a cyclone, something will happen and we're back to needing, you know, a lot of attention on rebuilding our roads and communities. Um, the challenges, I guess, is um, it's a really tricky thing, isn't it? I, I thought I put challenges in ahead of putting in successes because I figured that it's um, it's always easier to talk about um, I didn't want them to be at the end, <laughs> but I know Veronica said it was fine to me for me to do that. I, one of our biggest things we had is actually how to get to know industry. You know, we started off 18 months ago, uh, actually not necessarily even having databases and working out who the heck that we would engage with. Um, and I guess the other really significant um, part for us is, you know, the education, as you know, the education act changed and honoring fertility is a significant part, it underpins everything we do. And actually working out what that even means and how we look to engage um, with iwi and hapu. Um, we, were, we were really told early on in the piece as part of the setup that um, iwi did not want six cars up the drive. In fact, it will be more than six if HWDC went, plus the Workforce Development Council's to me to me. So we really need to think about how we'll work together and create some really enduring partnerships so that we are not putting that pressure um, on a small number of people often um, trying to do a lot for their community. Um, one of our another challenge is really ensuring that we hear the voice um, of those people that we haven't heard from before. Um, I can sit here as a Pākehā woman and say at times we women didn't get a voice. I'm really pleased to hear our, hear our Lincoln um, uh, people there talking about how they are having some of those conversations that are more challenging, keep it up. It's really important. Um, and so, you know, ensuring that we have a voice from Māori and Pacific and people that, you know, uh, tangata whaikaha, people that we might not have heard from before. You know, often it's been a, a small group who kind of leads uh, where the industries are going or the qualifications. So we need to make sure that that doesn't necessarily um, be the, you know, be the future. We need to be much broader than that. So how do we actually hear those voices? How do we actually hear a kind of voice? Um, it's tricky because it's not actually, you know, we're not front facing. So we need to be thinking about how we hear the voices um, and who else we can partner with to, to truly start to hear what's right for, for learners without getting ourselves in the weeds um, and actually being with learners all the time. Um, you know, part of our obligation is to hear voice of, of union and that's um, unions and that's new for us as well. So needing to think about building those relationships so they can potentially give us some employee um, perspectives as well. Um, the other thing is how do you actually make system change that's real and that it's not just a tick in the box exercise. You know, that's um, workforce development councils have not been set up for that purpose and we need to um, make sure that doesn't happen. I guess the privilege we have is that we get to be a little bit like Switzerland. Um, whether there's one learner or 20,000 learners, it's kind of irrespective um, to us. It's actually about, you know, we get to think about the industry and therefore what's right in that way. So that's um, a bit of a privilege. Um, and then how do we actually um, take the feedback that we get and actually make that real? So that's, um, you know, that's a bit of a challenge, um, a bit of a challenge as well. Um, just going to move on there. I just wanted to give a couple of examples um, of a, an actual piece of partnership that we've we've done for. I know TEC will be launching a video real soon that one of our team members has been part of. But you know, there's been a really good example of actually creating an environment that perhaps wouldn't have happened before, um, where Wahanga Araro has been able to work with uh, Naitahu 
uh, south-based construction work for central Dunedin who have been engaging with MSD, Te Pukanga through Otago Polytech and trying to create an environment that's actually going to really springboard this piece of um, piece of mahi uh, forward. So it's actually the, the building of the Dunedin uh, Hospital. And so we're looking at that in lots of different ways um, and how we can get the best you know, for our region and for industry. In fact, one of the really good things that's coming out of that's come out of this is the, there was talk of a need for a trade assistant, maybe micro credential, and we've actually partnered with uh, Hanga Araro, a uh, manufacturing uh, workforce development council, to look at seeing how we can develop something that would go across a couple of different uh, groups. Um, I'm not sure if I've got time, Veronica, I'm not sure who's got the time thing we've got, whether or not, have I got a few minutes to run this as well? So um, one of the other um, pieces, I guess, of great success was looking at um, some work that Wahanga Araro continued as part of a COVID project um, that TEC uh, funded. And then we looked at building a, there's a trade careers website um, and looked at doing some trade secret during trade secrets. And we partnered there with um, four of the work-based learning subsidiaries that are now part of Te Pukanga. So BCITO, Connexus, Competence and Skills, and looked at what we could do collectively to support, um, I guess, raising the awareness for women uh, about the construction infrastructure and wider sectors. So just, I guess, so just a reinforcement of just some of the stuff that we are trying to think about what we can do to support I suppose a different part of the industry, um, but looking at how we can sort of support employers to also think about how they can attract a whole group of people potentially, you know, when we've got labour force um, shortages, how we can support them to think about what else we can do. Um, my almost last slide is success and what will that look like? Gosh, um, sometimes if we had a crystal ball, it'd be great, but the shining light at the end of this hopefully gives us some some hope. Um, it's, a, it's a journey. Um, Ideally for us, that we'll have great relationships and to be able to provide accurate insights into what industry really wants. Um, TEC will be investing in what we think are the right things. Um, learners will get to enjoy success in whatever vocational uh, sector that they venture into. Education providers will be delivering right training in the right areas and actively providing training that meets the needs of their learners. Uh, employers actually have access to the skilled people that they want and that they get to support people training on the job. Um, all people can access relevant education um, how critical that is that leads to careers and enables them to support their whānau and the wider community and to progress into new areas if that's what's right for them and when they're ready. And the industry has the workforce that it needs so that we've got a productive and sustainable future. Fantastic. Um, a round of applause. Oh, sorry, no, carry on. Karen, no, go, go, no, go. No, this, I know that this, hopefully this will be shared. And so I've just saved some um, links at the end for people to be able to link into. So, uh, Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Erica. Um, hugely insightful. Um, that's also almost made me want to reconsider um, my own um, profession. I have, uh, Stu, are you raising your hand to help us there or are you clapping and that's just a raising of the hand clap? Yes, I think it is, Ace Joe. Wonderful. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Um, hey, look, so we now move to um, Peter Jones, who's Tumuaki and Principal of Manurewa High School. I've had the pleasure of working with Pete um, for probably almost close to a decade um, out at South Auckland, where we worked uh, quite heavily around the transitions of learners. Now, we cannot have the conversation around partnership with our Tawira without talking to our schools. Um, and we have one of our biggest um, co-ed schools here today to talk to us. Um, Pete Jones is a wonderful human being, hugely dedicated to his students and very biased of Manurewa High. So without further ado, over to you, Pete. And I'm um, recognising if you do need to run for the hills because of the floods, um, granted the fact that you are a principal who's been on this call for a little while, um, we absolutely understand. So thank you for that, Pete. Kia ora, Veronica. Noe, Māori. Um, for our Timon Language Week this week, which we're celebrating in the rain at Manurewa High School. Um, just bear with me while I share my screen. Hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, we are actually literally just about to close the school early. Um, so yeah, it is raining hard in Auckland. So 
Ko Emirates to Waka, ko Kadra Dres to Moanga, ko Tarisi to Moana, ko Mersey to Awa, ko Anfield to Marai, ko the Cop to Hapu, ko Liverpool FC to Iwi. Ko Billy Parry to Karangatira, ko Ken to Papa, ko Jean to Mama, ko Graham ko Aniban to Katena, ko Justine to Kaho Rangatira, ko Billy, ko Sam Ratau, ko Joa Katama, ko Matua Pete Jones to Kawingwa, no Reina, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Tato Katoa. Kia ora whanau. As I said, I'm the Tumawaki principal of Manarewa High School, and I am just stopping sharing because I realised I didn't do the include computer sounds. So I am just doing that now and going back to my presentation. OK, we should be OK. Um, so Manarewa High School, I've been working at the Kura since 2006 when I was fresh off the boat. Um, Tumaki principal since 2016. We serve the beautiful community of Manarewa. And we think we're the largest Pacifica school. Um, we're, we're pretty sure we're the large, largest urban Maori school. And literally at last count, 54 different nationalities, including a few old poms like me. Uh, we've got a beautiful vision statement, Pikiatu Kitirangi, aim high, strive for excellence, and some awesome values, but I'm not going to tell you about them because I'll let the students do that in a moment. Three key focus outcomes. We want our Akonga to be engaged in their Akaranga. We want our Akonga to be engaged in their cultural identities, strong in who they are, where they come from, helps with the where they're going part. And this is the big one for me, Akonga taking positive steps into, through, and especially beyond Manarewa High School. And I'll come back to that. But that cultural identity, it's really special. It's really important. It's incredibly represented at, at, at our Kura. Um, it makes our students and our whanau really proud. And we do everything we can to support and promote in that space. And because of that, we've developed co-design with our community an educational framework, Tiara Otafaki, which represents the community we serve. And I'll let our students explain it. Tiara Otafaki. Tiara Otafaki. The pathway of Tafaki. Tiara Otafaki is our educational framework that helps us understand the ideologies, systems, and processes that we have here at Manila High School. Tiara Otafaki means the party of Tafaki. According to ancient tradition of Mana Whenua, Waikato Tani, Tafaki was the ancestor who used vines to climb the heavens and received the three baskets of knowledge. Three baskets which Tafaki returned to earth with are known as Kete o Te Wanua, or the baskets of knowledge. These baskets are known as Aranui, Tua Uri, and Tua Tea. Drawing on inspiration from the story of Tapaki at Murray High School, we believe that when students bask of knowledge are full, they will have the skill and self-determination to follow their own pathway to success beyond school. Drawing on inspiration from Sir Mason Drury and Maxine Hemi, the Ara Otafaki is visually depicted through the image of Fare, which is the house. The Fare visual is delineated into sections similar to the structural components of a house. How order, well-being, provides the foundation of Te Ara Otafaki and specifically references Dr. Mason Deary's Te Whare Tapafa well-being model. Focusing on the importance of Tahafano, family and relationships, Tahatinana, the body, Tahinangaro, the mind, and Tahawairu, the spirit. Beyond the whole water foundation sits our school power, which are our standards and protocols, as well as our school values of respect, excellence, whanaungitanga and akaranga. Moving further up, there are four vines instead of pillars. The first two vines represent wānanga and ako, which embody concepts such as curriculum design, teaching and learning. The third vine represents tangata whenuatanga, and the cultural knowledge of Manirewa, Tainui, Waikato, and Aotearoa. The fourth line represents the 21st century skills that we as learners need to excel in the digital world. Above the Aka Vines sits our learner profile, and Ngā Kete o Te Wānanga, three baskets of knowledge, reflect the capabilities we need as learners to successfully transition 
beyond school and further into study, training and employment. Finally, the roof and apex of our fighting draws together our vision for all our students, founder and staff, to be happy, confident and proud. To have Tino Ranga Tira Tango for self-determination and to exemplify our school vision to always pick up to kids around me, aim high and strive for excellence. So, Kira, you have to understand Tiara Otafaki to understand Manarewa High School, and everything we do is through a Tiara Otafaki lens. The learner profile we were talking about, we co design this with our community. And when I say community, I specifically mean our business community as well and our, and our tertiary community. We wanted a learner profile that reflected the capabilities that young people need to be successful in the future of work. And so we are currently mapping our curriculum um, to those capabilities and our students in their Akaranga conferences talk about how they're developing and how they're growing in those spaces. This is the bit that I'm most interested in. This is the piece of data I think all secondary schools, in fact, all tertiary organisations should be judged by. Where do your kids go to when they leave you? And if they make a positive next step, if we support them to make that positive next step, whatever it looks like, then we've done our job. And we have the talent pool. So at Manarewa High School, and yes, I'm very biased, we have the talent pool that um, Auckland needs, that RTRO needs, that the world needs. And um, slowly the ministry is coming on board in terms of how important it is that we collaborate with our wider community around us. And we listen. We listen to Rangatahi Voice. So we've done a lot of work with the Southern Initiative, an awesome organisation. Unfortunately, they might not be around for much longer, thanks to uh, Mr Brown and his Auckland Cuts. Um, but that's another story. I'm not getting political at all. But we listen to our Rangatahi. This was a piece of work done around opportunities for Rangatahi in the green, sustainable, environmental tech space. But I love the insights. Relationships and empathy are key to learning. Rangatahi are motivated to give back despite the barriers. And again, to give you the content, context on that, we represent Manor, uh, the community of Manarewa High School under the old decile system with the largest decile one school um, in, in New Zealand. Um, transformations are hard and the Rangatahi were talking about the transformation into high school. They've not experienced it out yet. Actually, that's the hardest. And I think in Aotearoa, we don't do nearly enough in that space to support our young people in those first two years. The core subjects need to be culturally grounded to achieve equity. So we're doing a huge piece of work around local curriculum design. And we have to provide choices and pathways for all. So some of the things that we're trying to do, work transition activities outside the normal curriculum. Um, we've got our maker space, which is a beautiful student-led creative tech learning space. And we're really engaging with that local curriculum design. And I guess it's all summed up in that, in that image there of how we're trying to support our rangatahi as they make those next steps. And COVID's put a real spotlight in the equity space because the other bit we're working with is trying to keep our young people engaged in education and they don't go straight out to employment really early because there's some real issues and challenges in that space. One of the things that we've done is probably um, smash the biggest barrier to creative curriculum design um, and creative um, engagement with community in schools and that's the timetable. So this is the Manarewa Vataako, no barriers. And you'll particularly see um, Wananga on a Wednesday when we've really opened up our spaces, when community, business, community, tertiary providers can come and engage with us across a whole day. Um, and we've lengthened our Akaranga spaces as well. Also, we've provided spaces from a Hawara point of view for our students to connect. So they just don't come in and go straight into something that's prescribed for them. There's lots more choice and ACO Connect is, is one of those spaces that we're working in. And we have a real social uh, enterprise mindset. We've got a beautiful Mara. There's a great outdoor classroom, but also run as a social enterprise. Um, 
when the government came along with the school lunch program, we said, yes, please, but we want to do it ourselves. So that's a space when our level three hospitality students and uh, we happened to have a couple of chefs on our staff. We were able to tap into the beautiful um, resources in our community and the people in our community. So it created 15 local jobs and we serve 2000 healthy lunches every day. And we encourage all our students to take business. Uh, we've got about over 350 students taking business across all year levels this year. Um, so it's not just that you could work for the business, you could own the business, you could run the business. And we've been really successful in the young enterprise space um, for a number of years now, regionally and nationally. So it's a space we really support and, um, and really encourage. We're a trades academy school. We have been um, for about eight years now. We started with 40 places, now got 645. We coordinate across 10 other schools. We've got pathways in construction, engineering, logistics, hospitality, tourism, uniform services. We achieve in that level. It helps kids stay at school. It helps them stay engaged and it helps them to pathway into careers that have got good pay, future learning opportunities as well. So um, we're really proactive in that space. We've got an awesome project with the airport. Um, I chair the Ara Education Charitable Trust. That's a spin-off of Ara's Jobs and Skills Hub. We've got uh, four other high schools. We all sit geographically around the airport. Um, we were going great, providing work experience opportunities. The whole point is local jobs for local people and pathways for our rangatahi straight from school or connected with tertiary, but into the airport um, precinct. COVID smashed it, but we pivoted. Airport gave us their um, old paintball site. Uh, we've got houses off Kangora um, and we're refurbishing them. So particularly in the construction space, we've got lots going on. The airport precinct is opening up now, but this project is continuing. And I think by the end of this week, but the weather might have delayed us, we'll have nine site, nine houses on site. Um, we're connected with the local farm for young, young farmers. I'm on the board there. We're providing pathways into primary industries, which we know is a great employment pathway for our young people. And connecting um, city kids into that beautiful space is, is really special as well. And the farm's in Brookby, so it's actually only about 20 minutes up the road. And we're part of PTEC. Um, this is one of the deepest um, co-designs and the co-design model is the one that I think we should all be engaging with so it's got um, it's got school it's got business this is IBM's largest global responsibility program originally started in Brooklyn New York about getting young people into the IT industry from low socioeconomic backgrounds and it's got tertiary in there so it's programs three years of high school two years of tertiary work partners all the way through internships, cadetships, and eventually jobs at the end of it. So it's a, a really awesome model. And we'll do anything to get our kids a job, even teach them to drive. Got two cars out five days a week. Um, one's an automatic, one's a manual. And that's a qualification that at the moment, might not in the future, but at the moment helps young people um, get a job. And the reality is, we, you know, um, I think tertiary has got a lot to answer for. I'll put it out there. Um, they're one of the biggest barriers to creative curriculum design in schools, particularly at the university level, still demanding such siloed traditional subject entries. And actually for 70 percent of kids across Aotearoa, it's not the pathway. I think we should all be collaborating more to create those seamless pathways and to support our rangatai, especially in those first two years. Main Freight Hines came to the table. This is a beautiful programme. Three days in school, still get their level three, still connected with their education, but two days working with the employer and getting paid. And that's a big one at the moment. It was a big one through COVID. It's actually an even bigger one now with, um, with the cost of living crisis. So it helps our young people stay. We love working with people. So we've got a business academy that's focused on business, building business partnership and we'll work with anyone and we'll work with you to find out what's the best way, where the connections are, how that can happen. But 
The partnerships I really love is when we go deep and we get into uh, collaborative local curriculum design. But it's about recognising as well that teachers, we're not the guardians of learning. Anybody can learn with anybody at any time, in any space, anywhere across the school, in the school, outside of the school. And Makerspace is a beautiful example of that because it's student led but it's promoting creative curriculum. And it's a space actually as technologies continue to develop where our students have brought their culture and their creativity into entrepreneurial learning. So it's a, it's a beautiful synergy. And we've had some amazing projects that have uh, come out of that. Again, um, working with local entrepreneurs and we look to connect all the time. Sorry, I'm going fast on the slides, but I am really conscious of the time for you guys. And, and the real challenge is not just for Mary and Pacifica, Pacifica, but also for women. And we saw the example before about getting women into trades, and it's a great opportunity, but also about getting women into tech as well. So we're really promoting, really working hard in that space. So a bit of a snapshot. I won't give you time to read it, but I will um, I will happy to share anything that we've done. Um, I had a sabbatical last year in the education to employment space just for a term, and I've got a heap of recommendations. I won't go through them all, um, but some of them will connect with you. Some of them I've already spoken with you, and I'll, I'll trust you are um, speed reading there. And you know about the Workforce Development Councils, but if we're really working with them, we need to align curriculum with them as well. Um, and we, I guess a, a really, really big one for me is not just the creative curriculum design, but that successful transition support. We need to do way more in our in that space. Those first two years out of high school, whatever that looks like, that's that's a really vulnerable space and it needs a lot more support. And I know a lot of you guys are doing positive things in that space. And, and the second point on professional learning, we've got a lot of mahi to do with employers and still some, with some of our tertiary providers about creating safe spaces for our kids to go. And, and when I mean safe, I mean culturally safe. And a lot of our employers have got a lot of mahi to do um, to improve their knowledge and understanding in that space, which if they engage, will help them better connect and will provide them with a really engaged and loyal workforce. Um, but they really need to uh, be prepared to connect and to listen in that space. I think we should be paying kids to stay at school. Um, particularly South America have got some great uh, models in that space. And um, so lots more we can do in that equity space um, and some future focused ideas. But um, thank you for listening. Thank you for, for the time. Happy always to share anything that, that we do. Um, and Kakiti for now, but happy to answer any questions. Kira. Fantastic. Um, I mean, a virtual round of applause uh, for Peter. I think I speak on behalf of everyone here when I say the education system is very lucky uh, to have educators like you, your passion so palpable um, uh, and always advocating for our babies. Thank you for your candor and equally for the challenge around how we should be reimagining learner-centric models, um, particularly around partnerships. So um, what a treat. I mean, what a treat it has been to have all of these speakers uh, with us today, guys, from across the Motu. I mean, I just want to acknowledge this is not all of the context of the partnerships and model that exists within the sector. We just we don't have all the time in the world. So we chose these for um, and what a fantastic afternoon it has been to listen to all four of them. Um, we move now to some uh, question uh, time. And uh, before I get to some Q&A, um, our IT person, Ollie, fantastically is going to open up the permission so people can now be on camera and unmute yourselves. Um, so if you haven't brushed your hair, might, now might be the time to just make yourself look pretty amazing for the camera um, and if our panels who who all now look ready. Um, so uh, before we get to just some q and there's been just a lot of commentary to our speakers in the chat of just how fantastic you guys have been. Um, so if you haven't seen it, um, it is really just an affirmation of how right it has been to have you guys 
guys share and talk today. Uh, to the rest of our um, audience who's on, um, if it, we could just go with raising your hand. Um, if you want to make your question direct to just one person, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, probably with the time, that might be the better way to do. Um, to our panel members, if you want to add to someone's question, feel free to jump in and add as well. Um, so uh, anyone who might want to start off with some comments, um, we can start off with that first um, and then we can go to Q&A time. And just a, as a note, we don't have too much time on this. So um, I think we've got about about maybe 20 minutes um, at, at most um, of some discussion time. So um, any brave soul want to kick us off with a question or a comment uh, to the fantastic speakers we've had with us? Gosh, they were that amazing that we're just all in awe of them now. We just, just want to look at them fantastically and just be in awe. Go ahead, Stu. Uh, kia ora, V. Um, Pete, I just wanted to ask you, do you have a, um, a boarding school at Manurewa? Because I'm going to send my son to um, Tamaki. Uh, <laughs> he's 15 and needs some help, so thank you. Um, <laughs> That was that was awesome. Um, actually, a serious question for uh, Janelle and the Tawera down there. Um, not about the goose chase, although that does. I'm, I'm assuming it's in, like literal. <laughs> anyway, um, probably not something that will uh, will um, you know be able to be replicated in other universities around the country. Um, but I guess you know you guys obviously it's an amazing presentation and you guys are working so well together and it's such a great relationship you've got with the university there um is you know uh, exactly what we'd want to see uh, across the sector i guess you know if you had to if you could what what are the kind of one or two things that are the secret to your success what what makes it work um and you know is there something other universities other TEOs can learn um that might be able to do that as well. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'll start and then I'll pass the mic, but I think we have spent a lot of time talking um, and understanding probably a bit about what's been talked about today, understanding people's journey and what we want to achieve and a lot of empathy. Like I think we all come back to that piece. And I know it's probably sounds very simplistic and it's easier said than done, but we have spent a lot of time talking um, around tables and just getting to know each other and having the discussions and knowing, I guess, a bit about people's history um, to really build trust. And I'd say trust is our key one. That um, and everything we do is to protect and build on that. I think as well, um, Janelle talked about it at the start, but I guess in terms of a staff-student relationship, it's key. Um, to build that relationship and get engagement early in the year. And then also what Janelle said, like students at the call. Now, I'm not like, we definitely don't get it right 100% of the time. Um, and I think that like that's never going to happen. But I think if staff, uh, you know, can have students at the core mindset, um, then everything will flow on from that. You know, there'll be... Um, but as I said, our senior leadership team takes time out of their, you know, busy schedule to actually get input from us and, and, and have discussions with us. So I think that that relationship and students at the core is a vital piece as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with what's been said about relationships and students at the core. And I think also valuing um, teacher IT and making sure that we have equity and we have these values. And I think people actually put in effort to try and achieve students at the core and 2 partnership. 